Hi all, I'm Dr. Clark here again. And for animal biology today, we're going to talk about platyhelminthes, the phyla platyhelminthes, which belongs underneath the superphylum Lophotrechozoan. So we talked about A. Uh, Celiomorpha, okay? and now we're going to talk about platyhelminthes. Platyhelminthes is much larger and a much, I guess, a much better representative of Lophotrechozoans in, in the general um, premise of, of that grouping being kind of flatworm, acelomate, bi, um, bilateral symmetry, triploblastic. It's much better um, group because there's lots and lots of examples of um, platyhelminthes. Okay, so we're going to talk about three main classes. Tubularians, okay, um, which are the flatworms or free free swimming flatworms. Trematodes, which consist of quite a variety of parasites, liver flukes, brain flukes, um, intestinal flukes, uh, lots, lots of um, trematodes. And then we're going to talk about the cestoids, um, the tapeworms, a couple different varieties of tapeworms. Okay, so first we're going to talk about some of the flatworms, um, so the tubularians. Okay, so again, platyhelminthes are flatworms. They're acelomates, but they're on the, I guess, on the verge of being pseudocelomates because they start to have cavities. They start to have at least gastrovascular cavities, depending on the group. Okay, and there you start to see some compartmentalization going on in this group. Okay, so where we went left off with acelomorpha, okay, no colon whatsoever. Now we're still a, a acelomates or no colon, but we're starting to progress into being coelomates or having a colon. Okay, we're, we're going to address that in a little bit. Okay, so first, tubularians. Okay, the free living or free swimming platyhelminthes. Um, they're bilateral. And symmetry, acelomates, okay, but again, like I said, they do have some cephalization, so you start to see some specialized tissue, uh, you start to see some connective tissue and things like that in regions of their body. Um, kind of a precursor to being pseudocelomates. There are four main classes in the phyla platyhelminthes, okay? and we're going to talk about all of them. And um, there's kind of a unique loose tissue inside the body, which we call the parenchyma. The parenchyma is going to be in the mesodermal area. And depending on the group, depends on what uh, the tissue is used for. And in some cases, it can be used as a connective tissue. In other cases, it might be used as a tissue that helps with um, digestion, or it, it just depends on the region. But the parenchyma is kind of a loose, spongy tissue that occurs um, and, and is um, evolved from the mesodermal tissue and is part of the mesodermal tissue. And, and so it gets this name parenchyma, which often means that it has spaces um, in between uh, tissue layers or cell layers. Okay. So again, four classes. Um, we're going to talk about tubularians, the free living. We're going to talk about monogena. Okay, these are parasites that only have a single life history um, cycle. So in other words, they only have one definitive host typically, and they spend their entire life cycle in a single host. We're going to talk about trematodes, and trematodes are going to have multiple hosts. So they'll have a definitive host, which is the host in which they have like true reproductive parts in, so normally where they um, do sexual reproduction. And then they're going to have some intermediate hosts. Um, depending on the parasite will depend on how many intermediate hosts. I mean, you could have quite a few. Um, but often 
those intermediate hosts will have asexual phases of that that parasite type. Okay? And then cestoidae, okay, or the tapeworms. Okay? And we'll get into the life cycles and some unique features of each one of these groups. Okay? But again, there is a general characteristics for platyhelminthes for that flatworm group, and that is their triploblastic acetylomates bilateral sy symmetry. Okay, and so they're all grouped together. Uh, and we've talked about this before. The problem with uh, grouping organisms is that some organisms just don't fit, and you're going to see um, that's the case even under platyhelminthes. But uh, nonetheless, they still have at least a few features that are in, in common for all organisms within the group. Okay, so <clears throat> there are unsegmented worms, okay? and, uh, and when we talk about these free-living flat worms, they're not segmented, um, and even cestoidae, are not segmented, even though they will look like they're segmented. So they have stroboloid or strobilate, which are little like regions that their body is divided in, which we call proglottoids. Okay? Their body is divided, and um, it will look like they have segments, okay? but they really don't have segments. There's no um, connective tissue uh, dividing like each segment. Okay, and you'll see what I mean when we get to that point. Most of the time they have an incomplete gut, okay, and the diversity of kind of ga gastrovascular cavity or or intestinal tract really depends on the individual. Or or may, maybe less than the individual. Depends on the class. And when we're talking about things like Tubularia, they have a gut, and they have an intestinal tract, and they have most, multiple projections, and they can absorb nutrients, etc. And when we talk about cestoids, the tapeworms, they don't have a stomach. They don't even really have a mouth. Um, they just absorb nutrients across their membrane. Okay? So there's no intestines, no stomach, no, no, no real uh, digestive tract when we're talking about tapeworms. So it really just depends on the group what that gut's going to look like. The one thing that we start to see and that we didn't see really before is this ganglii, this cerebral ganglii, which is just kind of a more technical term for a brain. Now, I don't want you to think of like a brain and its complexity in the sense of like our brains. But it is a brain in the sense that you have this main control system or main control center, okay, with a nerve cord coming off of it or multiple nerve cord cords coming off of it. Okay? And so this is kind of the, the first group that we're moving away from just having a net of nerves to where we actually have a control center with a nerve cord and then branches of nerves coming off that nervous cord. Okay? So this is really the first group that we can start to see more derived nervous system. Protonephrida, okay, this is a organ or a group of cells, a tissue type that helps with osmoregulatory properties, excreted properties, properties, etc. The protonephrida is really the precursor to the kidney. Okay? It has a similar function to the kidney. It can filter um, waste products, but it can filter hemo or blood. Okay? And it really, that's the part that it, role that it plays is filtration, but also in the more, or I should say, less derived organisms like platyhelminthes. Um, you start to see other functions. Uh, you can see that it helps with storage of ions and things like that. Um, so it, it's a little bit of a more of a catch-all 
um, in less derived organisms, um, but becomes much more specialized as we move to more derived organisms. And you'll see what I'm talking about as we progress. Okay? Most of the forms in flat element, these are monoecious, meaning that they are hermaphroditic. They have male and female parts in the same individual. Now again, like I've stated, I don't know, numerous times, it's unlikely that the sperm of the same individual would fertilize its own eggs. Okay, So more often than not, what's going on is the sperm will be released and an egg will be released. Now these again, platyalminthes, they're going to occur, occur in aquatic environments. Whether that be the aquatic environment like inside us, inside our intestines, or inside a moist region like the kidney or the liver or even the brain of an organism, nonetheless it's going to be a aquatic um, liquid kind of filled region um, so it's external fertilization majority of the time sperm egg will be released and then they come together in that environment in that moist environment okay. and just like I said before when we were talking about the cere cerebral ganglia okay this has a true this group has a true nervous system okay we're moving away from a nerve net and into a nervous system okay? so you have at least one brain or ganglia that um, is in charge of basically interpreting signals. Okay. All right, <clears throat> the other thing that we need to talk about is that each one of these classes has distinct features. So under platyhelminthes, each one of the five classes has really distinct features um, that can separate those classes out. Okay. So first we can start with tubularia. Again, this is the only class that is free living, meaning that they don't have, they're not a parasite, and so they don't have this form that enters um, another host. Okay, so they're free swimming, free living. Uh, they have the ability to digest extracellular, so they do have a gut cavity, so outside the cells, and they will excrete digestive enzymes, okay, and then they absorb that in, or in some cases it gets like small food vacuoles would get phagocytized and brought in, and they would continue the digestion intracellular. So it's not complete, it's not a complete digestive system in the sense that you have food bolus coming in and being digested and then nutrients passed on. It, it's both extracellular and intracellular digestion. The protonephrida, again, this uh, primitive kidney, uh, it helps with osmoregulation, helps with water balance, salt balance, and also does do a little filtration. Uh, like I said before, they have a very primitive brain or primitive ganglia, okay, and a nerve cord um, running to that or from that. Okay? And most tubularians are monoecious. The other main piece, okay, and I have to drive this home constantly, tubularia are free moving. They're free swimming, okay, and they move by muscular movement, which they can move cilia, that their entire body is covered by cilia, and they have muscles at fire that allow them to move um, throughout a water environment, aquatic environment. Okay? They can be predators, and uh, I'll show you kind of an example of you know their morphology, but most are scavengers, and um, so most are going to find uh, a carcass and consume it. They're you know they're going to eat rotting flesh, that kind of stuff. All right, so here you can see the general perspective or general morphology of the organism. Okay, again, it's a flatworm, okay, but it does have kind of an anterior head and a posterior portion of the body. That anterior head is going to be where you're going to find the sensory organs. And in this particular group, tubularia, because they're free swimming and free living, 
they actually have the first kind of um, example of eyes. Now they're not eyes in a sense, it's not an, an actual eye, but it's what we call an eye spot. So in other words, what there is there is a small indentation in the tissue with some photoreceptors embedded in it. So you get this kind of small indentation, it's not very big, and but light will come in and because there's a small indentation one side will kind of cast a shadow when light comes in, it'll cast a shadow and so tubulariums do have the ability to know which direction the light is coming from and they actually sense if a predator or something moves over the top and casts a shadow so they know direction of light and they can kind of sense shadows. Now they don't have a lens so they can't make a you know a distinct picture and they don't even have those photoreceptive cells that would be able to distinguish kind of shape and things like that. But nonetheless it allows them to move through a water column knowing which way is up or which way is closer to the sun and knowing if you know if a predator or something goes over the top of them they know how to react to that kind of shading movement um, so they can move out of the way or, or seek um, shelter, etc. Okay, and like I said before, they have kind of this gastrovascular cavity, right, which has an intestine, um, a large system of intestines with lots of surface area um, and digestive enzymes that can be excreted from that, those regions. They have a pharynx or a mouth that opens into a pharynx. Okay? The mouth happens to be in the middle portion of the organism. Okay? So the head, or what you'd say the anterior end, is going to house that ganglia, that brain, with sensory organs. Okay? A nerve cord would run down the middle, but it's, the mouth is occurring at the middle portion of the organism. Okay? Again, these guys are hermaphrodites, so they'll produce testes. So they have um, testicles or testes, which will produce sperm, and they have oviducts, okay, um, which they can then, you know, fertilize or deposit eggs, and then they can fertilize eggs with sperm, preferably not their own. Okay? And so <clears throat> you start to have some construction here. Now you can see that it's an acelomate because you have the epidermis okay, and then you have the endodermis or the gastrovascular cavity and a mesodermis, the parenchyma muscle, okay, but there is no open spaces. There's no empty space, there's no um, mesentery or connective tissue or anything like that to you know, attach muscle to the intestinal tract or anything like that. So they are acelomates, but you start to see this diversity of structures, um, which really allow them to be more free swimming, free living, um, and progress evolutionarily. You can see other um, interesting pieces. So. Again, we talked about those eye spots a little bit. This kind of shows like eyes, but just just remember that it's not an eye. There is no lens. Okay, they're just photoreceptive cells, and they don't actually look like that. Um, not to make fun of someone's drawing, um, but that mouth, okay, opening pharynx on you know kind of the middle portion of the body into the digestive cavity. Uh, we already kind of talked about that. All right. Now, the system that is the primitive kidney or the protonephridin has a very interesting evolutionary perspective. And, and you'll see it as we progress. We'll see this again all the way until we get what we would consider a true kidney. You start to see the evolution of the nephridin or in the nephridopore. Okay. So what we have 
is a whole series of tubes. And they're kind of like fluid-filled tubes, but they're filled with water, typically, or some kind of um, mix of ions and water. And in some cases, depending on how much oxygen is in there, those ions uh, are going to be carrying oxygen, etc. Now, the system or the excretory tube system will end in a nephrita pore. Okay. Prior to the nephrita pore, though, that pore is going to release material out of the organism's body. Okay. Diffusion or, um, yeah, so diffusion across the epi epidermis or the external layer of the body. The inside is where you're going to find the flame cells. Now, depending, we're going to see this again, uh, we'll see other flame cells. But in tubularians, the flame cells look like this. They are a filament base, or they have a bunch of cilia. Okay? And so a bunch of fine filaments that allow for material to be captured or material to be passed into the fluid path. Okay? And so this can be waste products. This can be nutrients. This can be oxygen. Um, there's all kinds of ways at which this can occur. So you can think of the protonephridin, and it depends on the organism. You can think of it as not just a kidney, but it also has to do with respiration or the ability to move oxygen and carbon dioxide, for that matter, throughout the system of the body. Okay, so, so from you know, all regions of the body. Huh? Now these are just specialized cells that are, you know, working in unison as a tissue. And so they would have metabolic processes, nucleus, mitochondria, etc. Excrement would go across the flame cell. That would move the material in the path of the fluid. And then eventually that fluid is going to leave through the nephridra pore and out of the body. Now, there's other features with tubularian that make them kind of unique and, and nice from a scientific point of view and allow for them to progress in life. And that's the fact that they have this ability to clone themselves. Um, and they have the ability to reproduce asexually from kind of budding off, like you can kind of see here, they just pinch off and grow a new individual, but also from a point of view of if they're damaged. So say a predator had, you know, cut a little piece off one, they have the capability of regrowing that region. And it's pretty, it's nearly any region of the body, right? And they can regrow. They can regrow the anterior region. They can regrow the posterior region. Um, and they can do this uh, by basically budding off or going through um, what we'd call binary fission. Basically, they just pinch off and grow two no, new parts. So it can be done as a response to being damaged, but it also can be done as a response of there's no um, no reproductive partners or there's enough nutrients in the system that they can just go ahead and, and divide themselves and, and create a new clone of themselves because energetically they're, they're, there's plenty of nutrients or plenty of energy in the system. All right, <clears throat> so that's the free-swimming tubularians. Now we're going to move to talk about monogena, or the single host, single life cycle parasites. Okay. Monogenic flukes, okay, which are often, that's often the uh, common name for these groups, uh, is, is they're just either called flukes or um, if, you're trying to tell, you know, what, what's their life cycle like, then they're often referred to as the monogenic flukes, okay? So they have one generation, one life cycle, typically one host, okay? So they're not going through a bunch of phases, etc. And <clears throat> when it comes to monogenes, there's a lot that affect fish, and you're going to see even when we're talking about trematodes, Fish have a great number of parasites, um, and that probably has to do with 
the the longevity or the length of time that fish have been on the planet versus other organisms. And so you see this increase in this kind of parasitism, um, along with increases in symbiotic relationships and other things. The longer you've been, the, the more chances you have um, for an evolutionary event to occur and for it to be you know, selected by natural selection. Um, but nonetheless, monogenes are sometimes called the fish flukes um, because they're ectoparasites on fish, but they can also be ectoparasites on turtles and other things. Um, there's lots of situations where you see monogenes on aquatic individuals. Guys, this is, these are mainly aquatic parasites, um, but nonetheless, uh, fish are affected by them a lot. Okay? <clears throat> so they have a life cycle that, again, is fairly simplistic. So there's not multiple hosts. It's normally a single host in which they will hatch from an egg. And then the Economachidium will attach to the gills of the fish. Right? And then after the attachment to the gills of the fish by the Ostapter, okay, so this is a region, and, and I'll show you this a picture of this. It's kind of a region which has a bunch of hooks that allow them to attach to the gills of the fish. They'll feed, and then eventually they will <clears throat> mature out of the Economachidium stage and they'll move into an adult stage and the adult stage typically typically kind of gets embedded on the exoskeleton of the fish so like around the scales if the fish has scales or on the fins okay but they're an ectoparasite ecto meaning outside of the body so they're an outside of the body parasite um, on fish Except for the one life cycle that's kind of in the gills. Um, you could consider that, especially if the fish has an operculum, a gill cover, to be inside the organism. So here is what I was talking about with the osapter. Okay, those osapters are these uh, hooks or adhesive pads. They're, there's a huge variety. And in fact, the way that you tell groups of monogenes from each other is by looking at the thapter and seeing well what you know what's the hooks how many hooks do they have how many spines do they have how many pads do they have etc and that kind of allows you to classify them into genera and often into species All right, so until modern times where we can examine um, them using genetics right, until now really all the systemics or taxonomic um, advances in monogenes really came from examining this osthapter region. A little bit like the trematodes, okay, they have an intestinal tract um, and they kind of have a pharynx and an opening in which you know you would consider it maybe the mouth, but they have a um, kind of a a sucker region. On, on the one end, which we call the pro, proapter. Okay? So you have the osthapter and the proapter um, on opposite ends of each other. Now, depending on the organism, this can have spines also and can help with uh, kind of tearing away or um, removing flesh or drilling into the flesh of the organism. And in other cases, it's just kind of a sucker and they were, you know, they're, they're not associated with kind of damaging the fish and they might just eat the mucus of the fish, etc. All right, trematodes, very different story. Right? Um, not that the monogenes can't affect humans. It might be possible. I don't think there's any cases um, because we don't have an aquatic skin, but affect human meaning um, Monogenes can affect, you know, the bottom dollar, or affect humans' life um, livelihoods in the sense that a lot of fish farms uh, will have monogene infections, and the fish will be sick, and um, 
a lot of you know nutrient deficiency and things like that occur with those kind of parasite infections. Trematodes, on the other hand, their life cycle will often involve multiple hosts. And because they involve multiple hosts, they have the capability at times to encounter our bodies. Okay? Now, we're not the definitive host. Very often, they didn't evolve with us. Okay? So they can have detrimental effects on us. And um, in some cases, possibly call, cause you to die. But in other cases, cause you to be malnourished and lose a lot of weight and, and just be plain miserable. Um, but often that ability to kill its host is because the parasite is not in the host it evolved with. It encountered a new host. And the immune system of the new host either wipes it out or has really little effect on them and then the parasite can run rampant in the individual. And I'll, I'll talk about a little bit about some of these other ones as we go. So the class Trematoda is really divided into two subclasses right, at the time. Now again, like I said, a lot of this will change um, with more advancements in uh, genetic studies and things like that. You're going to see that some of this will have changed in your lifetime. But the two subclasses is Apsogastriae, Okay, and digenia. Now, digenia is by far the most species rich. Okay? Apsogastria is this ancient, ancient kind of prehistoric fish fluke um, or fish trematode. Okay? And digenes are the ones that we can get. Um, I don't believe Apsogastria humans can get them, but I might be wrong. Okay? Nonetheless, they're flukes just like the monogenes. Okay? And the difference is, is these trematodes or these flukes have um, a more advanced life cycle. In other words, they have more stages to their life cycle. And because there's more stages, they can be parasites on vertebrates, which means they can be parasites on us. They have a gut, a true gut. Um, and you'll start to see that uh, they are monoecious and they can go through life cycles throughout their life history they can go through different ways of reproducing um, so they can be sexually reproducing in one host normally that's the definitive host and then in intermediate hosts they can go through asexual reproduction or just clone themselves okay. so you can see that their diversity of morphological features is a little bit different but again it's very similar to Monogenes, and it's also very similar to trematodes. You're going to have a mouth. Maybe this has an oral sucker with it, a pharynx, esophagus kind of system, which is going to run into, you know, this intestinal tract. And depending on the intestinal tract, there might be some lobes that come off of it to increase surface area, that kind of stuff. That's really the digestion um, because they're just feeding normally on like blood meal or a little bit of tissue or something like that. It's not uh, an, a really advanced digestive tract. The gonads, again, these are hermaphrodites, so they're going to have testes, and they're also going to have oviducts, a uterus, that kind of thing. Um, most of the time, they're not fertilizing their own eggs. Uh, they're going to pass the sperm out, and then they're going to pass the eggs out, or vice versa. Okay. And other than that, there's not too much more except for they have a opening at the end of the organism. So they have a mouth, and then they have an opening, which often we might call it an anus. Now, it's not a true anus, um, but it's the ancestral form of the anus. Okay, And that really has to do with excretory vessels. So... What's going to happen is as those nutrients get passed and you get um, a blood system kind of running, you need to start removing certain things. And maybe in cer certain situations you have too much salt buildup or you might have too much kind of a, of a toxin or, you know, really too much of anything. That's what the, the excretory vessel is about and that's going to um, 
coincide and work with the nephrita pore, which we talked about when we were talking about the kind of flame cell setup um, in tubularians. Same deal, okay, except for it's just one kind of long tube that's going to take the excretory values and push or excretory variables and push them out through the nephrida pore. So instead of passing it out on a bunch of pores throughout the body, they just have a main pore, um, which kind of acts like an anus. Okay, now, the other thing that we start to see in these organisms, especially in the trematodes that are internal parasites, okay? so not the ectoparasites, but the endoparasites, the internal parasites, they have a very similar system to the intestinal tract of us okay, and other vertebrates. And if you look at the cells that line the outside or the tigament of the organism, so we're talking about the outside of these flukes, they look like this. They have microvillus or microvilli these little teeny finger-like projections, just like our intestinal tract does. That helps with absorption of nutrients. Now, often these organisms are going to be able to absorb nutrients from their surroundings. And if they occur as a gut fluke, so they occur in the stomach of the, region, of the body, they might use that sucker to attach to the gut lining and then absorb nutrients across um, through the microvilli. They might have some spines that are associated with it for protection. And again, you know, this cell structure, this nucleus with these long finger-like projections is super similar to the gut lining of vertebrates, and, and ourselves included, uh, that we think that it probably evolved, that kind of structure of cell evolved in trematodes and, and ancestors to trematodes a very, very long time ago. So it's really ancient kind of system that we still see in regions of our body, okay? but it's been around for um, hundreds of millions of years, probably somewhere in the, in the realm of at least 600 million years or so um, this system has been around. So it's kind of interesting to check that out and um, examine kind of that, that piece of evolutionary trend. Okay? So let's talk about these subclasses. So, Apestogastrae, which I talked about before, these are flukes that are, you know, ancient flukes. They've been around for a very long time. Okay? They're mostly parasites on mollusks, um, and they're a little bit different than what you're going to see when we look at digenic flukes or the other subclass of Trematoda. Their opsapter, instead of having a bunch of cook, uh, a bunch of hooks, okay, their opsapter is typically much longer and larger, okay, and actually has like a little bit of adhesiveness or um, suction to it, so they can attach to the um, internal wall of whatever they're being a parasite on. In, in the case of mollusks, clams, and things like that, they're going to attach near. The, the labial palpae or the gills that feed the mouth, they're going to attach there and start absorbing nutrients. Sometimes they attach on the foot and absorb nutrients um, also from that organism. Okay. <clears throat> the other thing that you can see is because they're trematodes, they're going to have an intermediate host. So um, maybe the definitive host is a mollusk, but then you might have an intermediate host being a fish. Um, or maybe the definitive host is a fish and the intermediate host is a mollusk. And so it depends on the species and um, whatnot, but nonetheless, it's normally kind of a, a two host system. You have a definitive host where sexual reproduction can occur in that individual, and then you have an, uh, an uh, like an intermediate host where asexual reproduction is going to occur. And that can be a huge variety out there. 
So like I said before, <clears throat> that Ostapter is very different. It's not likely to have a bunch of hooks, but maybe some adhesive septa right? or finger-like projections would which would allow them to kind of absorb nutrients. So I'll often it'll either be that they use this to kind of stick to the intestinal tract of something and absorb nutrients through the ostapter, okay? while also potentially consuming material through the mouth. But sometimes the mouth is used to help hold on and the ostapter region is used to absorb nutrients. It really just depends on the organism and depends on where it's at in its host, so in the definitive host or the um, intermediate host. All right, now the subclass Digenia, by far most species rich of the group, okay, and the one that affects humans most often. Okay, and so these are uh, normally just called flukes, and depending on the region of the body that it occurs, that's the kind of fluke it is. So if it occurs in your gut, it's, it's normally called a gut fluke. If it occurs in, in your liver, it's a liver fluke. If it occurs in your brain, it's called a brain fluke. And um, there's a huge variety of these. And, and depending on you know, the life cycle, it really depends on how they get to those regions. Okay. Most of them are aquatic, and so uh, they hatch in the water, and they become what we call mericidium. So when they hatch, they are free-swimming larvae. They have cilia all over them, and they can swim through the water column, and they can find their intermediate host. Now, again, the egg is going to hatch in fresh water, and then the mercidium is going to find an intermediate host. The intermediate host for most of these species are snails. Okay? And probably the best snails are the ramhorn snails. That probably has the most, but again, a, a lot of snails can be um, parasitized by mercidium from diagenic flutes. Mercidium will penetrate the snail, so it just enters through um, the fleshy part of the snail, through the foot, the head foot of the snail, it enters, and will form a sporocyst. Now, depending on the mercidium, where they form the sporocyst will depend on the individual species. Some go right for the gonad regions of the snail. When they make it to the gonad region of the snail, the snail is tricked into thinking that it's gravid, that it's producing eggs or sperm. Um, in, in the case of mo majority of snails, they're hermaphroditic also, so they produce both. But it's tricking the snail into thinking that that's what's going on. So the snail starts generating lots of energy and consuming a lot of food and pushing energy to that region, and the sporocysts get bigger and bigger and bigger. The sporocysts can develop into a couple different things. So they can be de developed into spor other sporocysts or daughter sporocysts and be defecated out or passed out through a mucus layer. Or they can be um, developed as radii, and radii can actually move back out of the snail. So it just goes right back out um, the fleshy part or the foot part of the snail. Okay. That radii will then develop into sicaria and then develop into metasicaria. Okay. Now the final kind of stop will depend on the organism. Now in some cases the sicaria and metasicaria will insist and become a cyst in a plant. In other cases, they will embed themselves in fish, and there's um, other cases where they embed themselves in invertebrates, other invertebrates, not snails. Right? Then from that, the cyst has to get back into the adult form. Right? So it has to go back into the adult, and normally that is through consumption of the cyst. So either aquatic plants that are being consumed with that cyst in them, <clears throat> fish that are being consumed that have cysts in them, invertebrates that can consume that have cysts in them. Once the cyst makes it into the adult final host, the cyst will then hatch, rupture, okay, and reproduction can occur in that host. Okay, so here you can kind of see that uh, life cycle. It's 
you're kind of missing the intermediate and final host, etc. But you have eggs that can be passed in fecal material, so that would indicate that the um, the fluke or whatever it is, um, the the diagene would be in the intestinal tract of the organism. Okay. So the eggs are then passed into the fecal material. The fecal material makes it into the water column. Once the the, um, the egg enters the water column, it can then hatch. It hatches into myrcidium. Myrcidium is free swimming, makes it into a snail often. Okay, it can either spore cyst um, or go directly to radii. Radii can swim. Okay, radii develops into a securia. The securia can then penetrate a fish, a plant, all kinds of things, become a metaseria. That metaseria is then consumed okay, and hatches into the adult. Okay. <clears throat> so there are quite a few um, that are important okay, and have uh, life cycles that involve humans. Okay. Often humans are not the determinant host but we serve as a determinant host when we get into these systems. So things like Chinese liver fluke, okay, and that has the ability to be encased in, into fish, and then by eating raw fish like sushi, you can develop a liver fluke, okay, which will destroy your liver um, and whatnot. We're not the definitive host, but we can get it, and it can do detriment to our body. Um, Fasicola heptica is another one that is aquatic. Um, it can enter um, the organism through being embedded into plant material and ate um, through aquatic plants. Okay, again, um, a lot of these are just that aquatic cycle of if defecation occurs in the water, that egg's going to hatch. It's going to penetrate a snail. The snail is then going to release it, okay, either um, on its own or having it burst out of it. Okay, it's going to penetrate fish, vegetation, something. We're going to eat it, okay, and we're then going to have the adult form in our body. Okay? And then a whole series of schistostomas. Okay, that's the genera. There's lots um, that can affect humans. All often all from eating raw fish, um, sushi, these kind of things, um, and the other versions of sushi, which I don't know the names for, okay, can all come from, uh, you know, you can all de develop a parasite from eating raw material. You can also develop, and I don't want to just say that this is purely, um, you know, fish-based, okay, there are lots of these trematodes that can be also beef-based, pork-based, okay, um, there are some trematodes that are, are found in chickens, okay, so there's a huge variety of parasites out there that can have a life cycle that's not purely aquatic, okay, um, and can be more terrestrial life cycle. So here you can see Chinese liver fluke kind of life cycle, final host, human, okay? eat raw fish, the raw fish had an, an incest, or a uh, cysted or medic syria that were insisted in the you know flesh of the fish was consumed it hatches eggs are released in fecal material okay into the snail snail um, releases securia securia embeds itself on the exo um, skeleton or the fleshy meat of the fish and then the fish is consumed okay um, here's another one schistostoma fluke that can you know happen through uh, the fact that you can similar system okay, defecation in the water uh, you get this metacidium that are going to penetrate snail snail kicks out a <coughs> securius the metasecuria or the securia can embed into the foot of the organism or it can embed into plants that the human can eat it etc lots of varieties um, they're not all the same kind of life cycle, but generally evolve this water snail 
terrestrial organism cycle. We're probably just a replacement for other terrestrial organisms. Uh, fish eating birds, okay, other fish eating mammals like raccoons, these kind of things, probably evolved with a lot of these parasites and have the parasite has less of an effect on them than say it does on us. All right, cestoids, real quick, like, um, so the cestoids or the tapeworms, okay, and um, they're mainly gut parasites or intestinal tract parasites. There's a huge variety of them. Okay. The one key feature that separates these from the other groups is that they really don't have a mouth. Um, they have a, a anterior region, which consists of a scolex. Okay, and that scolex will have hooks and all kinds of projections typically, which allows them to attach to the intestinal tract or the gut lining of an organism. After that, they'll have a small region, which we call the neck region, and then they will have stroboli, which are these segments that occur. Now, often those segments, which we call proglottoids, each segment is called a proglottoid, often they will have reproductive parts in them. So it's basically a mini version of the entire tapeworm. So again, like I said before, um, cestoids, they don't have a gut, they don't have a mouth, they don't really have an intestinal tract or anything like that. Um, they absorb nutrients, they occur in a region, uh, the intestinal tract normally. So the food bolus has already been digested and they're just pulling nutrients from that food bolus um, so they can grow. Their reproductive system occurs in each proglottoid. Two kind of um, sets of tapeworms. Okay, subclass Cestoidae. Okay, these are primitive fish parasites, um, primitive fish uh, tapeworms, and uh, just like the yeah, other Cestoids, there is no digestive tract. Okay, the other piece about this primitive group is their body is not divided into proglottoids. Uh, so there's just one single individual, and you're going to see they're not, in the sense of a tapeworm, they're not flat and, and kind of like tape. Instead, they're more rounded. and they're, They just have a very kind of different life cycle than a t typical tapeworm. They're also not very abundant. When we talk about primitive fish, and we'll get there, there are only a few primitive fish that occur on the planet still that would be subjected to this group of parasites. Um, things like gars, uh, things like um, sturgeon, paddlefish, okay? these kind of fish have the capabilities of um, passing and being subjected to a parasite from the subclass Cisteria. Okay. The other subclass, the Eustudias, or the true tapeworms, okay, are much more abundant and much more likely to be passed on to humans. Okay. It's a true tapeworm, or often gets the term true tapeworms, and that's because they're divided in the three regions that we talk about when we talk about Cestoidae, that class. That's the Scolex, the Nex, and the Stroboli. Now we have important tapeworms that um, we are subjected to. So the beef tapeworm and the fish tapeworm, um, we can get both uh, tapeworms. Um, I would play this video, but we don't really have time. So you can click on the link or put the <coughs> link in. It just shows you a <coughs> tapeworm inside the intestinal tract of a human. And you can see it's doing its job. It's absorbing nutrients, kind of thing, wiggling around, <clears throat> and doing what tapeworms do, right? grow and reproduce. Right. So when we start looking at those um, tapeworm morphology, again, that scolex re region is going to have a group of suckers or hooks. Okay, and depending on how many suckers or hooks, we'll determine what kind of group that tapeworm belongs to, what genera it belongs to. 
you're going to have a neck region, <coughs> excuse me, which often is long enough and, and is kind of species dependent. It's long enough to remove or pull the organism away from the microvilli of the intestinal tract so they can get out into the region where the food bolus is, bolus is going to be and can start absorption. Okay, So the neck is nearly directly related to how long the microvilli of the organism is. Okay? Those proglottoids will have the ability to absorb nutrients and they absorb them straight across the epidermis. Okay? And like I said before, these proglottoids are basically just reproduction pack packets. Okay, so they will have the sperm, they will have the eggs, the uterus, okay, the vaginal opening, the genital pore. They have it all. They have the capability of fertilizing or producing sperm out the vaginal pore or the genitalia pore. Okay, they can push the material out, have it fertilized within the intestinal tract to produce eggs, but on top of that, the proglottoids can break off and they can move throughout the system and still do reproduction. So you might start with a single egg producing a single individual, but then due to the proglottoids breaking off um, and forming new individuals, you might have multiple tapeworms within your system fairly quickly or within another organism's system fairly quickly. Okay. Like I said before, the scolex is really the important part when it comes to species um, indication, so indicating the genera or the species of tapeworm that, uh, uh, that you're dealing with. Okay? And often um, electron microscopes are used to take pictures of it, and then you can measure the angle of the projection or how many hooks they have or how many suckers they have. These kind of things is really determining. Now, that was really until modern times where we can just use genetics, but we still use um, the morphology to confirm the genetics often. Okay. So here's a beef tapeworm. Like I said before, um, you can get this from ingesting raw um, material from cattle. Okay. And so a human might have the tapeworm. That uh, proglottoid would produce an egg, the egg goes into the fecal material, the cattle can pick that up um, from the fecal material, okay, they can pick it up on their feet or whatever, um, it can get, enter their body pretty easily, the egg would then be hatched or the proglottoid would be ingested, so either one can occur, so it doesn't mean that the egg, they can form an egg or some segment or the proglottoid proglottoid can be removed. It can be broken off and passed in the fecal material. So it can be both ways. Okay? That's ingested by the cow. It hatches or it starts producing okay, uh, individuals inside. It incurs in their intestinal tract. They get tapeworms. And then we, by eating raw flesh or incested material, okay, we can get the tapeworm again. Now, often the concern with re eating raw meat doesn't come with eating um, muscle, say, in the legs or, or something like that, in the back of the organism. It's muscle around the intestinal tract. Okay? That's where the incested material is going to become, is around the intestinal tract. So eating things that, um, you know, like hamburger and stuff like that, that's raw, which you know, might have some internal pieces intestinal material mixed in sometimes or some you know scraps and things like that that's your best chance at getting a tapeworm from eating beef eating a raw steak it's fairly un fairly unlikely that you're going to get a parasite from that given the fact that um, they're not going to insist in in that uh, muscle mass of like the legs or something like that Fish is pretty much the same system. Okay, you can get the same kind of system, same kind of tapeworm from doing the exact same thing with fish. Okay, so human uh, <clears throat> to get to into the system through defecation in the water, that insisted goes into crayfish or it can uh, go into crustaceans. It can go into fish, be insisted in the body of whatever it is, okay, and then eating that material raw. 
um, or undercooked and give you a tapeworm and um, start the whole cycle again. Okay? Again, humans are not the definitive host often. We can play the definitive host because we're a mammal, but other mammals normally probably play that definitive host that eat the material raw. So things like raccoons or things like birds and, and other things that would eat raw fish or um, those kind of things can tip, uh, pick, pick up that parasite and pass it on back into the water. Okay. So humans are not a very good host because normally we're not defecating in the water and normally we're not eating raw flesh. Um, so we're not a very good host um, for tapeworms, but other organisms are, other mammals are. Okay, so with that, I know it was a long section. Um, I apologize for that, uh, but that really ends Platyhelminthes. We're going to now switch and talk about another phyla, another couple phyla actually, um, much smaller phyla, Nemerta, Gastrica, and Cyclophoria. Um, much smaller phyla, but nonetheless, uh, kind of have important features when it comes to Lophotrichozoan and have important features that show the progression of evolution to more derived species. Okay, next time, talk about those groups.